Um, it's actually great that the previous panel finished on saying there are so many use cases, we wish we had more time. Well, we are bringing you three use cases that we have been working on in the last couple of months, so hopefully you'll find this interesting. Um, a few words of context. We work for Iberi, which is a B2B financial services provider. Our main products are FX hedging, FX sports, cash management, and trade finance. And our decision science team is very focused on innovation. So most of our use cases are built in Python. And in the last eight to 10 months, uh, we have been working on an increasing number of use cases that have LLMs incor incorporated in them. So going forward, when we say LLMs, I will mainly talk about the OpenAI's GPT model that we access through the API, because that's the, that's the model that we have been using in our use cases. Uh, but before we jump into the first use case, let's have a very quick technical over overview of what we mean when we talk about LLMs. So there's been a large number of different algorithms throughout the last decade or so. But nowadays when we say LLM, we will mostly mean transformers. Not these ones, sorry for the terrible joke, but these ones, uh, which is, uh, it was developed by a group of Google engineers in 2016. Um, and transformers are a type of AI algorithm that was, that was specifically developed for natural, natural language processing tasks. And the new idea was uh, this, some, this idea called the attention mechanism, which means that now in the training data, we are able to relate two words that are not close to each other, but they have semantic, semantic connection. We are able to link them together. So when we train the model, it's able to understand that these two words have a relationship. Um, and when we talk about using these transformers, the G in the GPT stands for the generative element. So it's very important to understand that when you are interacting with the model and you give it a prompt, you will see the result uh, word by word. And that's actually how the generating works. Every step, it will ask, what is the next best word? And you will see that. And then that happens again and again. So every time it will just generate the, the highest probability word that will be correct for your, answer, for your question. So with this new attention mechanism, the generative model, we train this on a huge amount of high quality data, which is mentioned in the panel. The quality is very important. And with that together, we are able to have this model that understands semantics and the context in your training data. And this is how we develop. Uh, something that is good for long-term dependencies, long-term conversations. And as I mentioned, transformers were introduced in 2016. So why is it that only in the last 12 to 10 months is that we hear this hype? This is because the cutting edge uh, companies who are building these technologies have introduced an additional layer of technology called reinforcement learning from human feedback. This simply means that they have employees throughout the training process who rank the output of the model and then only the good outputs, only the good conversations will, be will the model be retrained on. This gives this human conversational element to, th to the model. So that was the technical overview. Now let's jump into the first use case. Um, the use case I've been working on in the last six weeks uh, is a tool that helps our internal users generate personalized recommendations for our clients. So the tool itself is based on, on, a, uh, on a Python web app. Um, and the user will go through it and bit by bit generate content that is an overview of our clients. So this overview will contain information about their FX strategy, their, their uh, current currency payments, etc. cetera. Um, and the idea is that our, our users, our relationship managers, can use this tool to generate these overview documents within minutes rather than spending hours on it. Um, so you might ask, okay, great, what, where do the uh, LLMs come in, into the picture? So throughout the document, we get uh, GPT to perform uh, various tasks at various stages. For example, we, get, we give it a long company description and get it to summarize it with a specif specific attention paid to a, a certain characteristics from that description. We also get GPT to answer questions from these long test, text. Um, and we also have GPT rephrase user input 
This, this is to ensure that it all sounds professional, there's no typos, etc. And then finally, we also use GPT to translate the final document to the client's language. So let's look at the simplified architecture uh, quickly. On the left, you have the user who is the relationship manager, and the user interacts with this Python-based web app. The web app throughout the process collects information from the data warehouse, various knowledge documents, and as I mentioned, it will interact with the GPT model through the API a number of times. Once the, the user has gone through the process and all the data points are collected, everything is double-checked and controlled, then we write all of that into a PDF, which is a, temp a branded template document for our users. But also we've heard in the, in the previous panel how responsible AI is very important. And for us, it's also very important. So we have built in a number of capabilities that ensure that this, this tool is robust, audit, auditable, etc. So I'm just going to go through this, this number of extra capabilities. First of all, we are calculating the cost of every interaction. We do this by counting the number of tokens that we use when we talk to the GPT model, and then just multiply that by OpenAI's cost per token. As I said, translating is an important element because we want to make sure that our clients read these documents in their own language. And, and next, we also log every single interaction that happens in this tool. This includes logging every single data point, every uh, GPT interaction, etc. This is not only ensuring that this tool is auditable and there is an audit trail, but this also means that our users can come back if they've abandoned the process, they can come back later, and then their information is pre-filled in the, in the form. And then last but not least, there's definitely a human element, which for us, for now, is very important. Our user still has to review the final document before they send it to the client. This is to ensure that whatever leaves our tool, even though we use LLMs, is still double-checked by a human. And that was my use case. Over to you, Andrea. And how do I do it? Oh. Thank you, Vic. So um, um, I hope you can hear me. So Vic uh, gave us a very interesting use case, which is leveraging mostly the generative capabilities of large language models. But of course, uh, we know that there, are other, uh, there is another side of the aspect, which is that the large language model can understand uh, vast amounts of text generated by humans, right? And so one of, uh, or a couple of use cases that I want to talk about today in this uh, respect are, um, well, uh, that's what I'm, gonna, uh, what I'm going to, to, to say. So the first use case is uh, uh, what we call a company website screener. So here the idea is, again, we have a, a web app with which the user, the internal user, mostly uh, our uh, um, operations, our um, KYC analyst uh, uh, team, uh, but also a transaction monitoring are going to use this app. And what they do, they, um, well, essentially on the app, they provide uh, the URL of a company. It can be a URL of anything in reality, but of course we're focusing on, on our clients or the beneficiaries or our leads. So by providing this URL, what happens is that we scrape the website. So we extract uh, pure text from the, um, from the website. We save it in the data where in the data warehouse. Oh, sorry, we save it in the data warehouse, of course, for auditing. But most importantly, we pass it to the LLM, which is instructed in this specific case to look for um, exposures to um, sanctioned countries. For instance, is there any hint that the company that the company who owns the website is uh, doing business in some sanctioned countries, or uh, perhaps within uh, um, within their activities? there is something that is beyond Ibris risk appetite. And so we want to flag this to the, to the analyst, right? So the output, if the large language model finds a red flag or more, the output is going to be, again, through the uh, interface, just a piece of text, a little summary with uh, the pos possible exposures and the sources, the specific pages where, you can, uh, where the analyst can double check. And so to see how this works in, uh, in reality. So this is just the interface, super simple. You just, the analyst puts the, web, the, the URL, scans the website, and the output is something like this, right? So in this case, this is a hit. Uh, it provides uh, the, the, the two uh, specific pages on the client website domain, where apparently uh, some, some you know, potentially uh, sanctioned countries appear. Now, I want to emphasize this is not just uh, looking up a word, right? So for instance, uh, uh, perhaps uh, there is no mention about Russia, but uh, it mentions St. Petersburg. 
So the large language model is able to understand, well, on this page they are mentioning St. Petersburg, so likely they have, there is some relation to Russia. And so notify that to the, to the analyst. And there is also a little summary at the end, uh, where, you know, just to give context on what are the activities so the analyst can you know, understand whether it makes sense or not. And of course, the analyst is instructed to double check, clicking on the, on the link and confirm that indeed this, in this, this, is, a, this is a red flag. So as Vic already mentioned, we always have a human in the loop. So, um, oh, by the way, I wanted to also say at the moment, uh, about this previous uh, use case, at the moment we are using this only for um, existing clients, but, you know, and for you know, screening for exposure, but why not think about extensions? For instance, we could screen potential leads for, uh, uh, for contacts or for interesting, I mean, to, to estimate whether they, whether they might or not be interested in doing business with us, right? based on the content of their website, right? Whether they might be interested in doing FX. So this is another thing we are exploring, which relies on the, on the website screener. So the other uh, and final use case I wanted to talk today about is uh, extraction of information from client documents. So as you can imagine, eBury has clients all over the world, and for many processes, many um, products we are selling, we need to collect some information from clients, and usually this information comes in documents, and the documents are completely different. You know, some, some documents are, uh, for some use cases, are standardized at the level of a country. Uh, others are, you know, a photo taken from, the, from your phone. So you know, we, we have a great variety of documents, and we need to be able to parse these documents and extract relevant information. So again, the capability of large language models to understand unstructured text and extract structured and relevant information. And here, I mean, I, there are, you can imagine there are several, uh, several uh, uh, applications. For instance, we, uh, for our trade finance product, uh, we, we need to look at invoices. And this is, of course, a great variety of, of, uh, of templates. So, and of course, the information we're looking for is uh, company name and address, uh, both for the buyer and supplier, invoice numbers, due date. All this is information that eventually gets pulled in our warehouse once you know, the, the, the document has been processed. For credit risk uh, assessment, uh, we want to extract the financials uh, of the companies for, from the, the most updated documents they can provide, which again can be internal documents of the company or country standardized com documents. So we varying degrees of quality. Um, and then there are other applications, of course. You can extend this type of general structure uh, uh, as much as you want. So here, of course, I should mention this is not just a large language model. There is first a component which is parsing the text, you know, perhaps it relies on OCR, optical character recognitions, okay? Uh, but ultimately, once you have a pure text, a large amount of text, you want, to, uh, you want to extract the relevant information through the LLM, to instruct the LLM to identify the relevant information and just provide that one in a, in a table, in a way that can be easily parsed by, uh, by other, uh, by standard algorithms, so to say. Okay, so these are uh, all the use cases we, we wanted to talk about. But also we should check whether our users, our internal users in our case, are actually using our tools, right? So actually here what I'm showing are the numbers of our very first uh, use case of LLM, which was just an internal chatbot. So this is a chatbot that our employees can use to ask questions uh, based on internal documentations of Iburi. And uh, this has been online since I think six months. And these are the numbers. So you can see we have more than 800 different users, and so this is about 50% of the company. We have several thousand sessions with questions and a very high rate of success of, uh, uh, of questions. We also monitor the, uh, the usage over time. So here on the, on the left axis, you see the users daily, and the, on the right axis is the price in dollars. So you see that the, the model is relatively uh, um, cheap. I mean, on a, on a day, is very rarely going beyond $20, so it's peanuts for for what it offers. And um, I wanted to ask to see if anybody's paying attention. Why do you think the first month the price is so low and then it jumps high? Is there any guess? Yes? <laughs> Close. We didn't have free open AI tokens, but we, at the beginning, the first month, we were using the GPT 3.5 model, which is 30 times cheaper. And then they came out with a GPT-4 and we switched. This means, of course, an increase in price, but of course the quality also improved a lot. So, and again, it's still very, very cheap for what it offers. Um, okay, so very cool stuff, but what about the challenges? Um, I mean, we have to keep in mind the issues. So as uh, has already been emphasized, uh, sometimes these models 
hallucinate, sometimes they misunderstand the question, or they just yeah, come up with stuff. So you have to be aware that there will be uh, errors in what you're doing. And an example of this is exactly the, the website scanner I was talking about, right? Sometimes the website scanner would tell you there is no red flag, but there is, right? So in our case, in, in the specific process, we instruct the analysts that if there is a, a, a hit, a red flag, well, double check it, but you know, we're gonna save you a lot of time. If there is no hit, still, you know, please check the website. Take a look at the website and make sure that the, the large language model didn't miss, miss anything. So we have a, 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 you know, a, human in, a human in the loop at the level of 4i check, if you want. Uh, it, also, we, we can improve the quality, of course, by prompt engineering, but again, this has its limitation. Um, another uh, challenge you have to keep in mind is data privacy, depending on the data you work with. But you know, in Iburi, we have a lot of personal information, uh, client information that we, we don't want to share necessarily with a, with a LLM provider that would use this information to retrain their models. Obviously, we are familiar with what happened with Samsung. So, um, so in this case, you just have to ensure, to, you know, to read the, the, the term and conditions. So that's actually why we are, uh, where we are using the OpenAI uh, API, even for the chatbot, as I said, we just have a chatbot that is simply a, a way to talk with, uh, with uh, ChatGPT essentially, because whatever they say on their website, right, in, their term and, in the terms and condition, whatever you pass through the API is not going to be used for retraining, it's not gonna be saved, so it's safe. As opposed to what you put in their website, right? If you connect to ChatGPT and write something there, they can, they can, they own it, so. Again, be careful about uh, this issue, keep it in mind. And finally, there are ethic ethical considerations, obviously. Uh, like, as these large language models enter, uh, you know, get more and more integrated in our, in our processes, um, jobs have, you know, this is going to affect uh, people. This is going to affect jobs. And here the solution, at least what we are seeing, is not, you know, to just not think about it and see what happens, but is rather to involve people and, you know, make them part of the conversation, train them, empower them to use these tools so that you know, they don't get left behind. And an example of what we're talking about, for instance, is exactly having the analyst always check as a, as a uh, you know, essentially he's in control of the tool. He decides whether to use it or not. It, you know, making his life easier as opposed to replacing him. So um, yeah, I think this, I mean, just to conclude, the, the large language models I think are here to stay and you know, they are gonna offer a great advantage to whoever uses them. So by all means, go out and design or implement uh, large language models within your processes. It's gonna be very beneficial. But when you do that, always keep in mind, first of all, to understand your current process and what are the pain points, whether there is a need, whether, is, whether there is a problem to be solved. If you find that there is a problem, think whether the large language model is the solution. Now is the hot thing, but is, is not a god, right? There are some things large language models are not good at, like you know, structure of data, modifications of the transformations or mathematical reasoning, very bad, right? So large language model is not always the solution. If you identify a problem that can be solved or you can help solving it with large language model, then go ahead and implement large language model, keeping in mind the, uh, the challenges we, we discussed, right? And apart from that, in our experience, it's just, you know, try and again, try and, try and error, right? Review, get feedback from humans, keep monitoring, and, you know, iterate and get better and better at, at what you're doing. Thank you. Any question? <laughs> Good morning, Ludwig Bull, Court Correct. Thank you very much for a great presentation on use cases. Just a couple of questions that are related, if that's okay. Um, so first question is about user adoption, because obviously this has an impact on people's work. So how do you make sure that they actually want to use the tools and aren't afraid of, dare I say it, automation? Um, and then secondly, around the technical bits. So why did you decide to, decide to use GPT-4 rather than fine tuning an open source model like Llama 2? And also, what are you doing on the evaluation side to make sure that the outputs are actually um, the way you want them to be? Thank you. Great questions. I'll take the first one. So we, when we design, when we scope the projects and design the solution, we do that with our users. So we talk to them, ask them what their pain points are, because at the moment we are not trying to replace any of our colleagues. We are just trying to make their lives easier. So they are involved throughout the whole process and then also involved in the testing process. So we get all their feedback and then implement and iterate through that. So we are definitely not at the stage where we create tools that will, that will replace them. Do you want to take the technical question? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, as for, so I think uh, the first question is about why we're using uh, uh, the ready-made model as opposed to, to, to train our own. I mean, to, to fine tune our own. I mean, we did some uh, some experiments with uh, hosting our our own models, but this is uh, um, well, at the, from our little experiments, is is way not cost effective at the moment for our use cases. Uh, the the pre-trained model is uh, is doing fine. Um, and uh, what was the last question? Sorry. All right. So uh, in terms of evaluation, I um, well, it depends, right? So in the in the case of the of the chatbot, essentially, is just we just gave the chatbot to 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 the people. We are saving, uh, recording their the questions and the and their answer. And then generally, I mean, at the moment, it's just purely collecting feedback from from people, you know, t telling that okay, this is wrong, this is good. And on more specific uh, use cases like the like the um, like the website scanner, I mean, we just track how. Um, you know how, how often the website, the, the, the scanner produces a, a you know a false positive or a or a false negative, and uh, so that's how we are at the moment uh, keeping track of our metrics. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm afraid there is no more time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.